I'm not ashamed. Why did John write the things that he wrote in his gospel? This is the question that we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of John on walking through the Bible. If you have a Bible with you, turn to John chapter 20. We're going to be reading from verses 19 to 31. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So John chapter 20, beginning of verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In verse 19, it is still the first day of the week. Peter and John had seen the empty tomb when Mary came and reported that the stone had been rolled away. John tells us that he believed Jesus had been risen again, though he didn't connect it with scripture yet. Mary Magdalene later saw the risen Lord at the tomb. In fact, Mark 16 verse 9 tells us that she was the first to see the risen Lord. After seeing him, she was tasked to go and tell the disciples what she had seen. John leaves out Jesus' appearance to the other women, as is told to us in Matthew. And John also leaves out Jesus' appearance to the man on the road to Emmaus, as is told to us in Luke. Why did John leave these stories out? Because they were not important. To his narrative and as we'll see in the next chapter because if he included everything jesus said and did it would be impossible to write because of the pure magnitude of it all coming now to verse 19 it is now late in the day on the first day of the week as evening was approaching the apostles were in an upper room and the doors were shut for fear of the jews why would the apostles be afraid because i'm sure the chief priests were looking for them wanting to know where they had taken the body of Jesus. Matthew said that they had that these chief priests had paid the guards to lie and it, that it had been stolen, but I'm sure they would have tried to kill the disciples too if they didn't divulge where the body of Jesus was. Of course, we know that the disciples didn't steal the body, that Jesus had been risen. The chief priests didn't believe that and didn't want the message of a risen Jesus to spread to the city for that would cause faith in Jesus even more than before thus defeating the reason that Jesus was killed to begin with. Closed doors, however, was no problem for Jesus, for he came into the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. Recall from three nights earlier that Jesus said that his peace he leaves with them and his peace he gives to them. Jesus is showing them the fulfillment of those words. He is risen from the dead just as he said. They can now have peace from the Jews and not fear any more, and they can have peace from God in that the price for sin had been paid as was evidenced by the resurrection. He allowed them to examine his body, for up until that point, many of the disciples still had disbelieved all the testimony that they had heard from the others that day. He tells the disciples that he would send them into the world to preach, and if they forgive anyone's sins, they will be forgiven, and if they retain anyone's sins, they will be retained. How would this happen? Was Jesus giving them the power that only God had? No, I don't believe so. 
The gospel preached is the message of salvation in Christ. Salvation is obtained through the forgiveness of sins, which was made possible through Jesus' death. But salvation from sin is not received until we obey Christ in faith. That means we need to believe in Jesus, repent of our sins, confess our faith, and be baptized for the remission of sins. That is the message that Peter would preach in Acts 2. So through the apostles' teaching, sin would either be remitted or retained. Now along with this, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. We know from the book of Acts that the apostles didn't receive the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost some seven weeks later. So what Jesus appears to be doing here is again promising them the Holy Spirit like he did before he was killed. Thomas, though, was not there when this all happened, and when the ten others said what had happened, he said he wouldn't believe unless he saw and placed his hands in the prints of the nails in Jesus' hands and saw Jesus' side that was pierced. Things Thomas would have known because John had seen them when Jesus died, that he, that he, and he said he wouldn't believe. At least Thomas said that. Thomas' attitude, one of unbelief, unless they see, is one we face today with many people. They don't believe in Jesus because they didn't see him raised from the dead, because they didn't see the empty tomb. And while that is all true, we do have the testimony of John and many other people who did see Jesus and say that these events actually happened. 1 Corinthians 15 would tell us that Jesus didn't just to appear to his disciples, but over 500 people at once too. If we had the testimony of even a fraction of this number of witnesses at a trial attesting to a defendant's guilt, the jury would convict in no time. John wrote what he wrote so that we could believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, sent from God, and that by believing we could have life in his name, the eternal life that only can come through Christ and the price for sin that he paid. That's why John told us about the wedding at Cana, about the healing of the nobleman's son, about the healing at the pool of Bethesda, about the feeding of the 5,000 and the healing of the blind man. That's why he gave us the many teachings of Jesus among the Jews in Jerusalem and privately among the disciples, all teachings attesting to his deity. And that's why he gave us his account of Jesus' death and resurrection. All of it was to produce faith in Christ. And then when you add John's account to the rest of the New Testament, there really is no excuse for lacking faith in God. The evidence for his truthfulness and accuracy is too great. The independent witness testimony too much. Now, yes, Thomas would see the Lord eight days later and profess his faith in the Lord as his Lord and God. But Jesus told Thomas because he had seen Jesus, he believed. However, blessed are those who having not seen yet believe. This belief would not be based on nothing, but, but based on solid evidence. And this blessing will come because the only way to heaven is through Christ, a person we have not seen with our own eyes yet know exist. The question is, will we believe in Jesus now, despite having not seen him, and be blessed later with eternal life? Or will we wait to see him in person on the judgment day, in the condition of faithlessness, and be eternally punished away from the presence of God forever? The choice is entirely up to us. With that, our time is up for today. Having now completed the four gospel accounts of Jesus' resurrection, it is now time for us to harmonize all four accounts so we can gain a deeper understanding of what happened. We hope you'll join us for that discussion in the next lesson as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Of his cross.